All right. G'day all. Uh, good evening. Hope everyone's well and safe out there. Justin Shaw, assistant coach of Melbourne United. Um, thanks again for signing up and joining our coach chat. This is, I think, our fourth one of these. And the topic we're going to try and hit today, tonight for you is how coaches impact the game in real time. Um, Dean Vickerman, head coach for us, is online as well. But then I throw a wave or a, a good day out there. <laughs> um, just some housekeeping stuff. Everyone's kind of on top of it already, but uh, just keep your, your vision on mute if you can. Um, I apologise if my dogs go nuts, but I've fed them and they're all asleep, so we should be good. Um, outside of that as well, uh, if you've got questions on the fly, just throw them into the chat and we'll hit them as we can. Otherwise, we will open up question time at the, the back end of each little section. And last of all, we want to thank Dream Street Lending for giving us this platform and allowing us to, uh, to continue to do this with you. Uh, as I said, tonight's topic, uh, how we impact the game in real time. And there's so many angles and, and different directions we could go with this one, on, uh, I feel. But there were three key things we really want to try and hit here. And uh, I think Kylie uh, from the office sent out our agenda with it. So timeout usage and philosophy. And Dino and I will hit. Uh, a little bit on on those parts, how to impact the game through uh, when there's stoppages and, and how we can you know manage different scenarios from that point of view, uh, and then something about controlling the rhythm of the game before we open it wide up. Um, do you know anything to add before we fire into this, mate? No, all good. Beautiful. Look at that, efficient. <laughs> all right. Well, the first uh, one we'll hit here is is timeout usage and philosophy. Um, and I guess for me, uh, Ian Stacker, a long time ago when I started working with him, just kept talking about the run of seven for me and that that was an indicator uh, to always be thinking about, well, what am I doing right now in the game? Are we in good shape? Are we actually getting the shots we want? Are we having a chance to, to have an impact on the game and it's just not going the right way? Or do we need to make change? And so he would always talk about the number of seven and that's something I've carried through uh, with my coaching in every level that I've, that I've worked at. Uh, so basically that means if there's a 7 nil run against us uh, or three possessions in offence or three possessions in defence where the game has been able to go one way or the other, um, I need to make a decision on whether I'm using a timeout or not. Sorry, Codes is just coming down the stairs in the background there, sneaking through. Um, so that number of seven is something I would give my assistants uh, a chance to track. And basically we would just know where our shots were coming from. In and that seven though, we wanted it to be something that wasn't a, a knee jerk reaction. So for me, uh, you know, we can, we can often confuse ourselves with where the rhythm of the game is going. And so for me with the assistants charting that, that run of seven was about well, what sort of shots are we getting? Are we getting the types of shots that we're comfortable with as a program? Uh, is it something that's coming out of action or is it coming out of transition? Where, is, where are we breaking down on our own offensive part? Is that generating the ability for them to run back at us the other way and get easy baskets? Where's our defense breaking down? So we're trying to chart more than just the actual scoring, scoring number on that. Do you know any comments in and around that? <coughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of different reasons why I think one of the philosophies that you got to think about as well is you know if you're a, a heavy running team and you know your objective is to tire the other team out, you know you're you're a team that uses a lot less um, timeouts as well. So again, just understand you know we had a team this year we felt where Mello as a as a still a young point guard that we kind of went into most games thinking we're probably going to use most timeouts because we, we, we still need that knowledge um, to push through to the group as well. So again, just kind of understand what group you have because it's obviously teaching moments that you need or you don't need with the experience that you have. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we really look at what we're working with as far as a team environment, you've got to also think about the why as to why you want to use your timeouts. And for me, there's three main things. It's to break the rhythm of the game. So as we spoke about that run of seven, uh, I need to use one to make sure that, yep, we're stopping their run. We're, we're getting ourselves a little bit of composure and being able to come back 
uh, to the directions or the, the outline or the game plan that we had in place. The second one is used to make some sort of change. Uh, obviously, if things aren't going in the direction that you want, if you keep doing what you're doing, chances are you're going to keep getting what you're getting. So using that timeout situation to make some sort of change, whether that's defensive scheme, whether that's a focus offensively where you think you might have be able to gain an advantage and go from there. And then the last one is use it to create an advantage. You know, you might have a timeout up your sleeve, low clock, you know that you can uh, draw an end out, side out that's going to give you a great opportunity for, for a last second score there. Dino, to add? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there is timeouts for, for rest and injury, you know, as, as, as do you want to take a, um, an elite player out of a game for a period of time or do you have that minute um, to try and see if he's going to be okay to, to get him back out there? And um, I think I've used very rarely the double timeout. I did see a, the, the timeout followed by a timeout at one of my daughter's games recently, but that was a bit of spite from one coach to the other. Um, but you know, rarely have used the, the, the double timeout, but have used it for an injury one time, I think, in, in my career to, to give that extra minute. You know, the, uh, I'm just going to talk about you now, Dino, and my working with you. For, uh, for a long time, for me, I've always wanted to try and carry my timeouts over into, like, so carry, have, make sure I've got two timeouts in the second quarter. Make sure if I don't have to use one in the third, I can carry that into the fourth and have three. Um, something in working with Dino that changed my whole perception on that was his willingness to just doesn't feel something's going the way that we spoke about pre-game. He'll ping one pretty early. And uh, I must admit, there's a few times I might tap Ross or in the past point and say, that's an early one. But uh, generally speaking, that's always worked out. Dino, do you want to talk about kind of your feel and, and that gut feel of when you're using those early timeouts? Yeah, I think, you know, it's obviously an opportunity to make change. And, um, you know, I've felt with our groups at different times, whether that be, you know, coming from a practice week where you felt that you needed to step on them a little bit and going into a game, you see the same kind of things. And it's like, well, if you're going to practice like that all week and step on people for, for not... Uh, achieving the things that you, you set out to do um, had more success in stopping it very early in the game. Uh, again, within a minute, minute and a half, you know, I'll, I'll use timeouts and um, especially coming out of a half time, if I really don't like it, the way the direction it's going, I'd rather, uh, you know, smash it early on. And um, yeah, I feel I've had much better success than that than trying to let them play through something um, that's critical to the, to, the, to the outcome of the game. And I think that one's really relevant to junior coaching as well, where you can sometimes want to try and protect things or, or you know, let things evolve over time. But if you see something, being able to have that, that impact straight away and, and being able to make change, uh, it is the greatest advantage we've got in our sport. I know when I was at the Institute in Tassie, talking to other coaches, they were kind of jealous in our game that we could actually manipulate and have some control on those sorts of scenarios as opposed to waiting till a quarter time or whatnot. A couple of questions rolling in. So Jacob, um, Dean, I'll throw this one to you because uh, Jacob asks, when in a timeout, what information is most important to get from your assistant coaches due to it being such a short amount of time? Yeah, for, for me, Obviously, having you know three assistant coaches, um, I want to have input from everyone. So it's walk away onto the court, give me a message pretty quickly, um, and try and make sure that you know you've already condensed it. And that's the job of assistant coaches. You know, and a lot of the things that they do is take a lot of information and condense it. And, and again, for me. Once I get three bits of information from my assistant coaches, I've got to go ahead and condense it again. Once I walk into a timeout, and I'm probably as guilty as anyone in the league about getting tapped on the shoulder, about trying to um, you know, use my time well, I'm trying to steal extra time in the, in the, in the timeout. But um, for me, obviously, I want to talk about what's going on currently, you know, what I'm hearing, why we've called the timeout. These are the things that we've got to deal with. And then, obviously, the next possession. If I'm getting those two things covered, um, whether you leave with some form of motivation 
um, or encouragement uh, about the direction of the game, that, that'd be the third thing that you'd get in. Yeah, and I guess from, uh, from you know, my role with our group, uh, one of the things that we'll always look at is where we can pick on the opposition from an offensive point of view. So checking, you know, has someone, has there been a change from the other end? Have they subbed in or out? And who can we go and attack? And that, that's an example of some sort of information I may pass on to Dino that right now we can go into a inside plays or it's more uh, effective to get them in, into middle ball screen, something like that. Uh, ben, your question here with young juniors, should you avoid over coaching and let them work it out, uh, p particularly if the clock keeps running? So I'm guessing a lot of our coaches are coaching in game situation when the clock's continuing on. Do you know your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think even when I watch, go and watch junior games right now, and, and to me, you know, that under 12, under 14, I'm, you know, when I was coaching that age group, I was coaching every possession. And, you know, I was really trying to feed as much information as I possibly could. I think that avoided, for me, some timeouts because I felt like I was and really active in my communication to all my players about what I was demanding, what, what we wanted, the encouragement of doing good things. Um, and, that, and it can be that simple, you know, at that, that age group that you can and stoppage in play, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on about the information that you can feed. But um, I think as time goes along, yes, you can test some situations about are they going to have the answer? Um, and again, you'll talk about with your group about how they huddle and how they share information, how they get to the next play. Um, but I think for me, I, I really, I was a runner of the sidelines coaching juniors. Uh, you know, I really was as close to being involved with the game as possible. Uh, just to continue to feed the information I think they needed uh, at that age. So overcoaching wasn't something that I was considering when I was coaching under 12s, under 14s. I think to add to that, it sometimes comes down to what phase of your season you're in as well, uh, in that there's got to be a point in junior development where we are comfortable with, I guess, a bit of mess and, and allowing athletes to, to figure some things out. Uh, basketball Immersion podcast uh, I listened to today from Jeff Van Gundy talks about just letting people play more, play more than drills and whatnot. And when we're talking about in the context of the game, I think there is something where if you're in that phase of the year where you can let trial and error be part of the development and, and the teaching, then that's okay. But then there's always going to be a period where there's got to be correction and, and the ways that we can make change uh, on the fly. And then there's always going to be the periods where, well, it's actually the part of the year where you're trying to get your grading or we're trying to win the championship, whatever that might be. So there's always a different different period where your thought and philosophy may change slightly there. Um, Alma Gautry, good to see you online again, mate. Your point here uh, isn't timeouts about giving your team the best opportunity to be successful. Um, absolutely. I think that's, that's fair to say. Uh, again, it's just about how we want to be able to impact those moments. Um, Oren, good to see you online again. Aside from foul trouble, could we talk about our philosophy on subs, uh, considering shooting slumps, poor execu execution or attitude or lack of effort? Uh, Dino, do you want to hit that one? Yeah, and I think, you know, most people, or most coaches kind of go in with a rough, you know, subbing plan about, you know, what you want. You know, you saw the Sydney Kings and, and, and Will Weaver really stick pretty religiously to the subbing patterns that he had all throughout the year. Um, you know, we go in with a plan. We, we talk about it. Um, we often get through the first quarter with, with something that looks um, like the pattern and then, and, and then we kind of roll from there. And, um, but you, I think you've got to have an ultimate plan about what you really want to see. Um, but then you see... Uh, Sean Long made a, an error that was something that we spoke about through the week and we pull him straight out. And, and you know, sitting on the bench is a, is a great teaching tool. You know, people who are going to make a response, you know, one way or the other. Certainly attitude and, you know, not springing back is some of the things that will make automatic subs with as well. Um, shooting slumps is an interesting one. You know, do you, um, does the problem get worse? if they feel that they've been subbed out for, for shooting. So, 
you know, I sub a lot more. If he's playing defense, I'll leave him in there and, and let him deal with um, that one and play through some of the shooting slumps if he's still doing the right thing at the other end and still leading and still doing those areas. But, yeah, I've not often, you know, subbed people for, for poor shooting. The foul trouble one's an interesting one. I think that comes to a comfort point for each of us as an individual, uh, you know, and also about the individual player. You know, are you comfortable with them playing with three fouls in the second quarter because you know they've got the smarts to try and avoid the situation or is that an automatic uh, trigger for you to be able to say, no, I can't can't risk that and, and go from there. So I think, again, that one comes down to a little bit on your individual personnel and, and what you're most comfortable with and how you feel uh, you can manage the game if, if that player was to go out. Um, Warren Brown, good to see you, bud. Uh, now it be done, would you have a 10 second video clip to show players good or bad? Uh, I guess, you know, do you want me to hit that one or? Yeah, you start with it, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> um, what we've done with our video stuff is we, we haven't used it on the bench, but what we have tried to do is get video to our players as quick as possible uh, post-practice or post-game. Um, it's something though that Dino and I have had chats about probably each year about do we do we try and find a way to get that instant impact? Uh, Dino, what's your thoughts around where we'll go with that one? Yeah, I think the um, obviously when a player's subbed out, you know, I really believe in that one to say you can sit down, you can gather yourself, and then you can see you know the direct footage about how you make a correction in an offensive or defensive scheme. Um, and then I think there's going to be more clarity, you know, to it. They, you can talk about it, but again, the ability to go see it on the bench, yup, I got it, I'm going to make a change. I think that one's going to be going to be massive. Um, where do we go with, you know, the, the timeout end of game play calling with, um, with, with video hits in that one? It seems to be you know, becoming a little bit more common that people are just finding on the iPad, you know, the play that they want down the stretch rather than drawing it, you know, really showing people. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that one. You know, I want to, I want to trial it in, in practice, um, you know, seeing someone different other than yourself or different people in different spots. Does, how does that relate back? So, yeah, I want to, I want to um, examine that one a little bit more about the, the end of game situation. What, do the people understand better? Do they understand the pen better? Do they understand the visual? Um, yeah, I want to understand that one a little bit more myself. No, that's a good point about how our athletes learn. That's something that we definitely found a little bit different in our group this year. Um, Harvey, your question here, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, Dino, providing feedback as to an athlete on why they've come out at a, any given time. Um, do you, do you hit that straight away? Do you delegate? Um, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, for our guys right now, you know, I'm more than willing to grab a few of our guys straight away and say, hey, this is what's happening. We need to make, we need to make a change here. But again, this is a sandwich technique for, for juniors. Hey, I love your energy. I love this. But, you know, you've, you've turned the ball over the last three times. Um, you know, love that you're seeing that guy, but we've got to be able to deliver these passes and, you know, being able to make sure that there's a correction, but there's also a positive. I'm only leaving you here for, for, for a minute and a half and then you're going back in. Whatever, you know, is that next step that knows that, yep, I've got to, I've got to accept this criticism right now. I've got to give you better, but I know coach still believes in me. He's going to get me back out there. Yeah, I think uh, one of the interesting things that occurred with our group this year, and it's something that's got me thinking about any team I work with in the future, is the guys came to us and basically said uh, to, to us as assistants, we just want something when Deno takes us out. Whether it's a positive, whether it's a negative, just give us some sort of sort of hit. And so kind of from midway through the season, we, we did that. And I just found that was interesting that that's what this group was about. Uh, definitely other groups in the past, I'm not sure that's, that's uh, the necessary, but but it is important to understand what does what do your athletes need at any given point, um, and I think that's going to change every single year. Uh, to to couple on the back of that one, uh, Jessica, your question there on 
you know, if a junior, an under 12, under 14 athlete is uh, making mistakes, how many mistakes do you allow them to make before you, you sub them out? Uh, Dino, do you want to talk from, I guess, our level is what, where that sits? Yeah. Um, again, I'm seeing a, a KPI question kind of come up. And, and, yeah. and again, you, you know, you are what you really believe in. So again, if there's a, um, a defensive error that you've worked on all week and you get back cut and, and we've done it, you know, we've, we've played against Adelaide and it's like, we have no, no back cuts tonight. We're not giving up any. And then in the first three possessions, we've given up a, a back cut. And so, um, you know, that one either requires for me, I've got to make a timeout. We've got to address this one again, or we've, we've got to, we've got to, you know, I've got to find some time with that person to say, this can't happen again, or you're coming out. And so, um, you know, you can still give people some chances. There may have been a situation that, you know, he got out of position for whatever reason, but given them, you know, is it an automatic or are you going to do it straight away? So you have to hit it on the head the first time it happens, though. They have to know that, you know, that, that's, that was wrong and that was against the game plan. I think... I think Dino's answered that one pretty well. I think it always comes down to what you're accepting to live with. And I think Dino articulated that one pretty well. Um, there's a couple other questions here that will link into where we're heading in the chat. So I might just move ahead real quickly on, on uh, one of the other, or two of the other areas we wanted to hit, which will answer some of these questions. Um, but the next part we, we felt we can impact the most on is stoppages. Uh, and it's something that I heard Rob Beveridge talk about a long time back about every time the game stops is effectively a timeout on the floor where your point guard and you can at least have eye contact. And uh, that's something that I've tried to, to reinforce with all my point guards is at worst, just give me a look. Uh, if there's something I feel I need to share at that moment in time, that allows me to do so. Uh, but then it also gives me a chance to just say, no, you've got it and you're good to go. The other part is obviously we can add in so many different cues at any moment that allows us to change things on the fly without needing to be able to call a timeout. It might be a defensive change up, might be an offensive uh, system scheme. We can throw those in, into play. Your thoughts on that one, Deno? Yeah, I think again, Mellow's a, a good experiment with this one. You know, as we as I learned a little bit about him and. Um, it was, we got to a point where now individual meetings is like, Mello, I need you to come and stand with me at free throw situations, at that stop, at a long stoppage. I want you to come and chat with me. Tell me what you see on the floor and I'll tell you what I see and we'll make sure that we, we're getting on the same page. And then if there's a message to deliver about how we move forward for the next huddle. Um, but again, he just needed, um, give me a couple of plays that you see for other people. Um, cause he, you know, he was unbelievable at, you know, getting his own, but he knew he didn't see the whole game where there was mismatches. So that was the ability for me to, you know, help him, you know, in that area. But yeah, the free throw situations is a, is a big one. And uh, as the season wore along, you know, I'd look at Mello and say, you got it. And whether that was the next defensive coverage and he's like, yep, I got it or press or disruption or whatever it might've been. Um, but yeah, it grew as the season went along. Just from a, a junior perspective, I know with our national team, there's been a few times where I'll talk to the athletes about we've got to huddle at every stoppage and, and, and take care of what's next. But what I learned over time is athletes don't, you can't presume they actually know how to take care of that what's next moment. So really influencing, well, what does that look like for your group? Uh, when we huddle, let's, let's talk about purely what's next or is there something that you've got as a cue as to review and then move on? Um, the big one for me was we were constant steps forward. Uh, that's just a little Crocs mantra that we've always used. We don't take backward steps. So when we huddle, we're talking about what's next. What do we got? To, what do we need to do to make sure we're moving forward on the next possession? Um, so there's there's two parts to that. Where yep, we definitely want to be able to influence from a coaching point. But if we can educate our athletes in practice environment to be able to take care of some of those things as well in huddles that can be a real advantage for us on those stoppages. I think uh, it's a, yeah, a great chance to, to refocus an attitude as well. You know, we've, we had a big one about, you know, if a teammate grabs you and pulls you into a huddle, you have to let go whatever is 
disrupting your focus to go ahead and step forward. And we were challenged with that a few times this year where people wanted to continue to talk to the referee or were still frustrated. But in, as generally, you know, as a group, they were pretty good. Once, the, once a teammate grabbed them and pulled them in, that part was over and let's move forward. And, you know, that's, it takes strong leaders to do that. But if you, your group is, has the ability to grab someone who's stepping outside of your system, um, you can see great benefit in it. Beautiful. The, uh, the other thing that I think for us to really understand and, and be in control of is the rhythm of the game. Uh, you know, to me, good offense has a, has a great rhythm to it. It's got a beat to it and the ball movement, penetration, everything works in, in sync. So as coaches, how can we continue to find ways to change uh, that rhythm for our opponent? Uh, I'm a big uh, person that, that wants to teach the game as a game of opposites. Whatever we try and achieve offensively, or we're going to try and take that away defensively. So things, uh, and leading into questions now, but what change-ups can I actually use to make sure uh, in the rhythm of the game to change things? If a team's playing really quick, well, what things can I use to slow them down? And that becomes what the basis of maybe one of my timeouts is or what the direction to one of my players is in the huddle. Do you know thoughts on, on changing rhythm? Yeah, and I think, and you know, Justin really pushes me uh, to, to do this. And, um, you know, I probably still don't do it enough. But what I'm more comfortable with is when we've spoken about in our team meetings about what's our plan B, what's our plan C. Um, if that coverage is failing, you know, are we going more aggressive and less aggressive? And so um, once I'm really comfortable about talking about all the changes that we think and understanding, you know, what advantages, you know, we're going to have to um, challenge with our defence and we've spoken about it, I'm so much better to make those changes. But to make a change on a fly um, where I think we won a game in Wollongong a couple of years back where we had a defence that we hadn't even explored uh, we threw it out there. We were down 15 and we win a game uh, doing something that we haven't really practiced. So, you know, there's still that part of it. But again, a much better comfort level about talking about plan A, plan B, plan C before the game. And I think, uh, you know, uh, the Nick Nurse box and one. <laughs> don't feel like I'm missing. So, uh, the Nick Nurse box and one in the NBA finals is one of those where Sometimes you have to be daring enough to be able to just throw something out there that you may not have been able to spend a lot of time on, but you can actually see that there's, all right, that might be the advantage that we can create, even if it's just for one or two possessions, but be able to get that information across and go with it. Uh, the other part is, for me, getting your teams to really understand, well, how do we change rhythm of the game without us needing to use a timeout. So is it a two-for-one situation? Are we a two-for-one team where our, our athletes know, yep, that amount of time's on the clock, we're absolutely going for it. So that's a way we can control our own rhythm and our own uh, beat in the game. Yeah, same with the fouling situation. The other end, you know, are you a team that, you know, when you're three up, are you going to foul? Are you going to do those kind of things to make sure that you, you've set that one, those kind of rules with your team about... Um, you know, the timing and um, possessions that are left. Beautiful. We'll hit, we'll hit a couple more questions here. Uh, so from the Count of Hoops, I'm not sure who you are, but good to meet you, Count. Um, Two-part question here, Dino. How do we go about using and anticipating tactical changes from the, the opponents uh, out of a timeout? Yeah, I think there's... <laughs> There's pretty good knowledge of, of our scouting about, you know, are they a team that will flip to zone? Uh, are they a team that will come out and, you know, blitz the first on ball out of a timeout? You know, there's a few coaches out there. Andre, you know, is one that likes to really go and, you know, hit some of those first possessions and double team something to, to try and blow it up. Um, there's a few zone coaches out there for one possession. Um, so, yeah. We certainly walking into the timeout, there will be a good reminders from assistant coaches. Just be ready for uh, the blitz. Just be ready for the zone. You know, make sure we're running a play that that works for both. 
Uh, the next part to that question is our own change-ups. Is it a sometimes thing and every time thing? Uh, you know why we would make our own changes. Yeah, I'm really a on the fly coach with the um, will we set up in in a zone formation? Um, do we trust our people to to bust through everything in 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 some of those late game you know defensive schemes? Um, I've seen success in both. Um, some teams that we've had practiced a little bit more um, our end out of bounds zone, and we I think we won a couple of games against you know Perth over there with some with some late zones against them. Um, but yeah, I'm a real feel for the game on that one. Um, my trust with zones at different times wavers, and um, but you know doing it to um, take away a catch and shoot uh, and zoning areas, I've found a good success with that one. Yeah, for me, the only part that I'd add to that is, uh, and I know there's some guys on here that I coach against, so <laughs> maybe I'll have to change this tactic. But if the opposition coach has called the timeout, I'm absolutely throwing something different uh, as we come out of that timeout. I just see that as a chance to potentially grab two points that they couldn't get. So if they've called the timeout, that to me is like a default setting for me where I'm absolutely making change as to what we're doing because they, they're specifically trying to do something there in. Uh, whereas if I've called the timeout, that to me is kind of like what Dino said. It's, it's really a gut feel at that moment as to why I've called that timeout and where we're actually tracking at that moment in time. Uh, Lee's got a question here, Dino, on huddles. During under 14 VC rep games, I get my boys to huddle, particularly on foul shots. How do you recommend you handle this when they when they don't huddle <laughs> yeah and I think you know obviously video review is um, something that we all use and um, you know often we get our our games cut just in offensive and defensive lines um, but again I might watch our offensive line that night might watch our defensive line in the morning but it's always important that you go back and watch you know, the in-between parts. There's a lot that you learn about players' body language, a lot that you learn about uh, how your team functions with those communications. So if you feel like it's happening irregularly in a game or regularly, um, just to be able to film that game, to be able to show it back and say, look at the outcome of this. It could have been better if we huddled and we we're all on the same page. No, beautiful. A similar line question here. Um, what would you consider the best way to motivate a group in a timeout, under 14 group, but just any general group that isn't paying attention to the game plan? And how do you get them back on track to that? Yeah, and I think you've got to keep making sure that they've got ownership as well. So, um, you know, at times it's even good to to step away in those kind of situations. Yep, you can continue to feed, you know, the positives. And if they're not um, responding to positives, then it's going to be have to be player led. Um, Mandy, you've got this next time out, um, and and let them try and actually lead something because if they're not listening or responding to you, um, you know, you can go two ways and go really positive. You can go, you know, quite negative to really pull them in need to try both of those things. But again, if they fail, it's on them to take some leadership and get it done. Yeah, for me on that one, like asking questions is a good one to always have engagement. Uh, so, you know, what ask them what coverage are they in? Then you get a response, All right? Now, what do we need to do to be able to attack that? Hopefully we've been able to spend that time in practice and, and they can come to the conclusion themselves. Uh, especially when it is a game plan that you've drawn up on the whiteboard pre-game. There should be some key points, uh, hopefully one or two dot points that you know you can draw back to at any given time in the game. And at that question point, they should be able to give you the response that, that you're desiring. Uh, one on here on the point guard being the on-court extension of the coach. Do we have any uh, suggestions on how to teach young point guards uh, to evolve with this skill? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. And and it doesn't have to be the point guard. You know, um, we've had different leaders on different groups. And, and so 
you know, even at the breakers, you know, a Dylan Boucher or a Mika Vicona on free throws, when we're shooting free throws, would often be the guys that w- would come over to make sure that coach and player are on the same page uh, for the next disruption coming up. And because they're the point of the disruption, um, guarding the out-of-bounds guy, are they going to trap? Are they going to clog the middle? You know, what, what, what's their next disruption? Are they going to take a, a gamble somewhere at halfway? Um, I think, you know, it's a tough one teaching leadership, you know, and um, there's a lot of point guards coming through that are real scoring point guards now and, and are taking less leadership on. So um, and it's not always going to be directed at your point guard. I think they've got to be involved in the, those conversations, but I think you, you may have someone else who's a better leader on your team. So um, having different people at practice, what we do is, when we're changing from drills at different times, we'll just get one player from one team, one player from another team, bring them over, give them some information and let them go and lead their teams. I think it's important to continue to do that with a lot of different players that you build leadership in everybody and not just your point guard. Absolutely. And I think the other point is the you don't have to have the ball in your hand to, to lead and help your teammates uh, figure out what should happen next. So being able to have everyone be an extension of you is, is definitely an advantage if you can generate that. The times of that, like to try and hit one point on it, uh, early days with any junior point guard, I think if you can get them to have a second catch mentality for their own score, that definitely helps get them thinking about, well, how do I get others involved before it comes back to me? Uh, that's a little side angle on, on probably the direct question of it, but that's uh, just some, some food for thought on that one too. Uh, another one here that we'll just jump to quickly, which ties in with it uh, from Paul is while the other athletes are huddling, you know, the other four athletes and the, the point guard comes to you. Um, is that the best way to get them to take care of that? Or is a, a message yelled out? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think on, on free throws, normally uh, the group has huddled um before so with Mello, there was a quick huddle with them and then Mello would come and talk to me obviously when the huddle was at the other end of the floor um you know that has to happen uh, you have to have visual communications with them if you want to be able to change something that they can get it done in the huddle then come and talk to me while the free throws are being shot um make sure we are all on the same page but yeah i think that normally we don't have too many four-man huddles it's all, either you're all in or we're all doing our job. Beautiful. Uh, Caleb, I like this question. How willing are we to call the timeout uh, when the other team is in possession on a baseline or side out, uh, giving them a chance to draw up a play? Thoughts on that one, Dano? Yeah, again, it's a, it's a, it's a clock situation as well. Um, I've certainly used it to say, you know, if it's uh, out of bounds with 14 seconds and there's 20 on the clock um, to say, you know, they, they're going to have to shoot it. You know, this is if there's a scenario to say if they score, if they don't score, these are the kind of shots that we're looking for going the other way. Um, and again, you know, are you going to be that coach that they know you're going to a zone or they know you're going to trap a corner or are you going to be one that they're indecisive and, and it's making them think about, all the possible things that you're going to do rather than worry about the play that they're trying to execute. And I think part of it comes back to your non-negotiables. If, if it's a moment where you feel something has, has been left that, that you absolutely need attention on for that last possession to have a chance to, to get the result you want, then that becomes a, a reason to do it. Uh, for me, the interesting one on, on the question is, uh, so in a world championship, I religiously zone and outside out. Um, big part of that reason is because of prep time. Um, and so, you know, we'll have different things that we do in, in those moments. So I feel a lot more comfortable to call a timeout in those scenarios in that environment where we've got a default, we know what we're doing, and we know that they probably understand what they're going to try and go to, but that gives us an advantage, we feel. So... I think it depends in, in what sort of scenarios and environment you're coaching in at, at that given time. Uh, moving down to a couple more here. Timeouts for the sole purpose of advancing the ball into the front court. 
is there a certain time that you use this? Say under three minutes or under two minutes. Uh, Dino, do you want to do you want to hit that one? Yeah, no, I'm I'm a little bit on feel for that one. Um, you know, again, if you, it's only going to be, um, you know, where you're scared of um, making a turnover in the backcourt. You know, with those really short clocks that you go ahead and advance it just to make the catch uh, inbounds. Um, yeah, I, I I play that one by feel. I don't have a time limit on it. Um, again, depending on who's on the floor, what's happened in the past, the team that we're playing against, what kind of traps, you know, they have the ability or do they have a, a, a great guy that is in denial. Um, yeah, feel for me. It definitely has. I think there were a couple of scenarios this year where we, we did have that conversation there and we, we sort of decided, yep, we were comfortable with just having you know, 25 seconds and we we're going to play that thing out or there was, I'm pretty sure one time we, we said, no, nah, we'll go, we'll advance it. We we, need, we know what we're running, we'll, we'll go with it. Um, again, you know, to me, the best case scenarios are when you've already had those things played out in your head. And we had an exchange coach with us last year, Kenny, who uh, he kind of went through to the, to the second, a whole different number of scenarios with us. Uh, that, that gave us basically a framework, framework to say, this is when we should, this is when we shouldn't. Uh, Dino, you want to hit, hit that a little bit? Yeah, it was quite an unbelievable matrix that he put together. Um, obviously, it was based on time score and amount of, you know, amount of possessions left in the game. And, you know, it's really it was trying to work out, you know, when you need to start fouling, depending on, on the point spread, and how many possessions that were left in the game. So, yeah, amazing matrix that still sits on my computer now. Yeah, I mean, for, for all of us, it's a really good exercise to just kind of think about with the group that you're coaching at any given time, and that changes variant to, to what age group and what level, uh, but what are you comfortable with in, uh, in those sorts of scenarios as well? Uh, do you have a team that can advance the ball from the backcourt, or are you turnover prone and, and ready to go? I remember Guy Malloy, getting angry at me in a bronze medal game because I advanced the ball uh, with a Tassie team. But I said to him afterwards, we've turned it over 20 times a game up until this one. So I wasn't going to let that happen. So you've got to know your group. You've got to know why you're doing things. Um, I'll merge these last uh, two questions here together. So do, you know, uh, um, do we have notes during the game as head coaches? And if so, what's included in the sheet? and roles of assistance during timeouts and stoppages. Um, I'll let you hit that one first. Mate. Yeah, I normally take um, my shoot around practice plan in the offenses that we've, um, we've done at shoot around and just have it in my pocket. Um, special situations, the two or three that, that we went through. So, you know, they're the kind of notes that I carry. Is that answering the question? Is that the... Is that where they're I think going? so, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I carry those notes. Um, and then, you know, roles of the assistants. I challenge my assistants to try and be as, head, as much head coaches as possible. So I need the referee to tell them to sit down. So if they see something in the area, defensively or offensively, I want them standing up and going to that player and totally trust what their communication is going to be because we've already had those conversations anyway. So... I really want to challenge the rules there as much as we could have three people standing up talking to people at a stoppage. I'll be more than happy with that one. I think uh, to, to piggyback on Dino's comments there, like for me, the notes that I'll take into it, uh, just reminders. Um, so on my whiteboard, I'll have my after timeout plays for that week just stuck on there so that if it comes to that moment, then I've just got those cues there for myself as well as uh, the key pick-on plays that we've identified through prep through the week. Where do we feel we've got an advantage against them? And just so it's a reminder, um, I think the game is pretty organic and, and I can have a plan in place, but if I'm too uh, restricted by the notes that I've got, I, I feel that sometimes I lose my way in, in where the game's going. Um, as far as assistance, to me, that's very similar. Like I've loved working on the Dino and the... It is that, that ability to be able to throw anything at him at any time. And sometimes you run with it, sometimes you won't. And I think that's the role of any assistant is uh, free license to, to make a suggestion at any given time, whether that's a stoppage, whether that's in the flight of the game, 
uh, and to think of the game as a head coach because I think the more you're thinking of that versus just jotting stats down, um, the better chance we've got of, of having success with it. Um, last question we've got here is in, in what ratio do you call the offensive actions versus allowing your point guard to call them? Uh, Benno? Yeah, I think when I, I know there was a, a time when I was in Wellington coaching over there and I had Mark Dickel as my, as my point guard and he kind of joined the team late. So on a lot of walk-ups um, and after scores, I was kind of suggesting plays from the sideline to him. And then we had a really good conversation afterwards about, hey, you, you trusted me as a point guard. Make sure you, know, you trust me to, to call the right play. And, um, you know, I've, I've played some pretty elite basketball around the world. And so I felt like, yep, that was great feedback for me to say I overstepped uh, the mark a little bit. And so, again, a lot now is not so concerned about what we're running just to make sure that they're absolutely all on the same page and in a grant from their huddle. So more conversations with my point guards, have you guys got it? Um, and then I'll step in when I really need to, but um, I just want to make sure that all five people know the shot that we're going to get and it's been communicated well. Yeah, I've, uh, so for me, you know, the first eight seconds of any shot clock is really the player's time. And I've always lived with that as, as pace and we're trying to hunt numbers advantages and trusting the athletes to make good decisions in those moments in time. Second, the numbers advantage is gone. We're about ball movement and then getting them to understand that. The walk-up component for me uh, or a dead ball scenario really comes in the preparation during the week. Again, comes back to, uh, well, here's three key plays that we know we can have great advantage against this opponent this week. Uh, and then the keys are handed to the, to the guard to make appropriate reads in that given time. The other part that I really want to do is empower uh, any of the athletes to, if they feel there's an advantage on the floor or whatnot, to have that conversation. And then we can, that might be a chance where at the next stoppage, yep, let's go into our horns actions or whatever it may be to go and find that advantage. But going into it, I, I really like you know, our point guard to know, well, these are the three main plays that we know we can gain an advantage in this game. Yeah, so and again, we had one of those situations preseason in the in America where we'd gone through a practice session and and Sean was angry at the end of it, and then but we didn't quite know why he was angry about that he hadn't touched the ball, but he hadn't voiced to anyone that he felt like he had a mismatch either. So um, yes, it's responsibilities of point guards and teammates to make sure that people are getting different touches, but you got to put your hand up at different times and make sure everybody knows that you, you've got the best advantage on the floor because you're being in some ways selfish by saying nothing. You know, we want you to put your hand up. We want you to make sure that we're going at the best advantage on the floor. Beautiful. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up there, guys. Hopefully we've been able to give you uh, some, some thoughts and some ideas around the reasons and the why of what we do with our timeout usage and stoppage and how we can impact the game in real time. Uh, but at the same time, hopefully there's some thoughts there that you've had as well that you go, no, this is something I believe in and, and the way that I can keep impacting things. Uh, Dino, any last words to wrap up, mate? No, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun part of coaching, right? And, you know, we're in, you know, preparation is fantastic, but being, um, on the court, making real life decisions. Um, we're one of the sports that has the ability to, to impact um, what happens on the floor a lot. That and the balance of empowerment to your players um, is, the, is, the, is the situation everybody's got to cross um, to find which one's more teaching or more empowerment. Um, and keep challenging yourself with, with those two to, to get a great result. But um, thanks for tuning in. Um, Justin, you want to talk about tomorrow? Yeah, so Kyle will get that one out, I think, straight on the back of this. We've got Phil Handy, uh, LA Lakers assistant coach, uh, doing an individual athlete development uh, session for us. And then, obviously, we're going to keep these things rolling. As, as long as we're in isolation, you'll see Dino and I chatting. So keep an eye out for 
upcoming uh, coach chats. And again, we appreciate the feedback. We, we love uh, the stuff that we're getting back and your interactions when these ones are, the, are at their best. So appreciate all the questions and keep tuning in. Stay safe, guys. Thanks. See ya. See ya.